you hear me okay? I have to wait for a moment. Um, I too wish to thank the organizing committee, uh, Instar, Austin Speak for putting together this master course. Um, I think this may be the first time I've been called a master of anything, so this is great for my ego. Um, I also want to apologize to the translators because I have a tendency to speak too fast, uh, and so I will do my best to uh, speak at a, a pace that allows for good translation of what I, I speak, what I say today. So today I'll be speaking about uh, the assessment and, and management of problem behaviors, uh, and I want to thank Dr. Chawarska for, for her talk because much of what she presented today leads in very nicely uh, to some of the topics that I will cover as far as early development and how the manifestation of autism at early ages can in turn eventually produce in some individuals problem behaviors. And I'll speak to that effect at some point as I go today. As I get started, I want to recognize some of the, the foundations uh, and institutes that have funded some of the research that I'll present here today. So I want to thank NIH and the Organization for Autism Research for funding some of the, the data collection that has gone into this talk. So I'd like to begin by speaking about just problem behavior in general. One of the things we know is that the prevalence estimates are quite varied. There does not seem to be much consistency uh, in the estimates of the prevalence for problem behaviors. Some of this has to do with the definition that is used for problem behavior. Some of this has to do with the measures. But in general, um, some of the better studies have estimated that the prevalence of problem behavior in individuals with autism spectrum disorder can be as high as 80% as in some studies. Um, and these problem behaviors take various forms. These can include things like aggression, so hitting, kicking, and biting. Uh, tantrums that involve screaming and disruptive types of behaviors, self-injurious behaviors like self-hitting, banging one's head, biting oneself, uh, other disruptive behaviors or destructive behaviors, uh, behaviors like pica, which is uh, the, the swallowing of inedible objects, which can be very dangerous. Elopement is one that is maybe not as known, but refers to leaving supervision, walking away or, wa or wandering away or running away from a caregiver. Um, this is a behavior that is, is less recognized in some cases, but is also very dangerous. There are some uh, studies that suggest that this behavior in particular uh, contributes more than anything to the premature death rate in children with autism spectrum disorder, and problems with toileting and other adaptive behaviors. So there's a wide range of problem behaviors that all fall under this general heading. I want to show just a few videos to, to give you an example. I, I too am a clinician as well as a researcher as well as an instructor. And so I wanted to show some videos from the clinic that I run. This is our most severe program. Um, at their, this is a service for some of the children who exhibit some of the most severe behaviors. We provide a continuum of services at Emory University. But this is an example of one young man. He's about 16 years old. He weighs about, I don't know, how, I don't, 200 pounds. I don't know what that is in kilos. Um, but he's a large young man, um, he's very aggressive, he has hospitalized his caregiver on multiple occasions, uh, he has destroyed a, a, a van that they used to transport him uh, from the inside out, so he can be very aggressive. You'll see staff working with him, trying to walk him through some tasks. You can see that they're wearing some protective equipment and that's to manage his aggressive behavior. So just to show you an example of some problem behaviors. I don't think there's any sound that you'll be able to hear, but you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. So he starts to bite himself, and the therapist is trying to get his hand out from his mouth, um, and then he starts to hit. And you can imagine if you're the parent of this child, and you're alone with him, and he gets upset, um, how challenging it can be to just get through day-to-day -day activities like teaching him any skills if you're his teacher, um, or getting him to do basically anything that he doesn't want to do.
Okay. This is a young man who engaged in self-injurious behavior. He would hit himself in the head. He's wearing a helmet here. He's also got some mitts on his hands that, put, that pad his hands. Um, in our clinic, we have about a six hour day. And so in a six hour day, when we first started to see this young man, he would hit himself in the head. We had people counting and he would hit himself about 8,000 times in a six hour day. Um, he had, because of the repeated hitting, he had uh, blinded himself in both eyes just through the repeated blunt force trauma, through disconnecting his retina, and also giving himself cataracts in both eyes. Um, let's see if we can get this one to play. Thank you. So this is a therapist. You'll, I'll, I'll explain some of this later, but this therapist is intentionally trying to restrict his attention because we're trying to see the role of attention and whether he's engaging in this behavior to get attention. We eventually learned that that was not the case. But you can see he just continues to wander and basically just hit himself more or less continuously as long as his mother is basically not sitting next to him holding his hands down. So the only way for her to manage his behavior would be to literally physically restrain him. And she came to us saying that her goal for his treatment was for her to be able to take a shower um, because she had to have another caregiver in the home for her to be able to leave him alone for five minutes so that she could shower or cook a meal. This is a young woman, this is the last one I'll show. This is a young woman who um, would get very destructive and aggressive anytime an unexpected noise would, uh, would uh, arise in the environment. So many times the family would be out in the community and someone's phone would ring and she would grab their phone and destroy it. Um, this would be a stranger's phone. Um, and at one point in her school, uh, an alarm sounded, a bell sounded, and she climbed on a desk and ripped the ceiling, tore out a chunk of the ceiling and ripped it down, and it fell on another student. Um, so we can go ahead and play that one as well. So you'll see the sound goes, and then she becomes quite aggressive um, to her, her staff, the staff that we have. And this, this would be very reliable anytime any unexpected noise like a phone ringing would occur. And again, her teachers were not very well equipped to deal with this level of problem either. So I show you these videos in part just so you get a sense of what I'm talking about. I think that sometimes we who are clinicians or those of us who see families who are experiencing these types of behaviors are not always well, um, are, are not always appreciative of the type of problem behavior that we're talking about. Um, we don't always have a good appreciation for the type of problem behavior. You know, in my clinical life, I sometimes, I talk to a lot of families, and I remember not that long ago asking a family how they were doing. And they said, we're getting by, we're doing okay. And I said, well, what does doing okay look like to you? And the family said, well, doing okay means that we're more or less safe most of the time. Um, we, if, our, if our son gets upset, uh, he was about 11 years old, if our son gets upset, we take the two younger daughters, we move into a back bedroom, we barricade ourselves inside by putting a dresser in front of the door. That takes about 45 minutes to an hour. Afterwards, we come out, we look at how many holes he's put in the wall and decide how much drywall we're gonna have to buy this week. We don't have any glass in the home. We've replaced all the glass with plexiglass. We have the windows screwed shut. We have two deadbolt locks on the door. One key is kept by the, my husband, and I keep the other key on our person because if one of us is ever knocked unconscious, we need to make sure that he's not going to be able to get the key and get out. And this was getting by. This was this family saying, we're generally doing OK. Um, and I think that that reflects a tendency for some of the families that we serve to habituate, to, to get used to problem behavior, and it's a very gradual process. This young man didn't start out like that. He started out much like some of the children that Dr. Chawarski was talking about. But as through some processes that I'm going to talk a little bit about today, these behaviors and some of the, the, the core symptoms that he did exhibit over time evolved into this situation. The family had evolved along with him um, and had adapted and, and adapted and adapted to reach a point where their version of normal was very different from what most of us think of as normal daily life. It's not hard to see problem behavior and the effect that it has on the individual. So some of these behaviors have direct ramifications to the individual, physical harm. So we see two children who engage in self-injurious behavior. And you can see the harm is being produced by some of these behaviors like self-fighting and so forth, um, self-injury, headbanging, the young man who had blinded himself. All of these are examples of, of pretty direct impact of self-injurious behavior. 
but they also have a lot of indirect effects. These can be things like exclusion from the community. So some of these children are not able to be in regular education settings, particularly because of problem behavior. Not because they can't learn, not because they can't gain skills, but because problem behavior is preventing them from being integrated with their peers or being in classrooms where they're most adept or most able to learn. And of course, this causes tremendous stigma for the individual. Um, this too has effects on the caregivers and the families of these children. There is a lot of research on this showing that just in general, individuals, families of individuals who engage in significant problem behavior are just poor, poor functioning families overall. Um, one of the studies that's been done showed that the level of problem behavior exhibited by these children is a more significant predictor of family functioning than the core symptoms themselves. So it's a greater predictor of outcome for the family than the severity of the autism symptoms themselves. There's also a tremendous strain on marital relationships and other relationships within the family. These are families that often isolate themselves from their communities. Um, they don't go out. I, I hear families tell me, we don't go to family functions. We don't associate with our family. We don't go to church. We don't interact with our community in any meaningful way. Um, it also is predictive of problem behavior in siblings. And lastly, uh, many of the families are underemployed or unemployed because one of the caregivers has to constantly remain uh, with the child. So these are, are significant, uh, has a significant effect on families. So I want to emphasize that these types of problem behaviors are not a core symptom of, of autism spectrum disorder, and that should be clear, especially after the talk we just heard. But what they are is a product of these core symptoms. So we heard earlier today about some of the core symptoms, and it's not hard to, to discern how those symptoms themselves or some of the, the aspects of the autism spectrum disorder can produce these types of problem behaviors. So for example, if you're someone who has deficits when it comes to social interactions, it's not hard to see how you might not have the same types of social relationships as other individuals. And if you don't have those social relationships, you might not be able to have the social supports that you need in order to function within society effectively. It's not hard to see how if you have deficits in communication that you might exhibit problem behaviors. And there's a very clear link between deficits in communication and problem behavior. If you cannot effectively express what it is you want from others or what you want in your environment, you might find other ways to access those things. And that oftentimes means resorting to problem behavior. If you can't tell someone, I'm hungry, or I don't feel good, uh, or I don't like it when you do that, you might learn pretty effectively that if you engage in problem behavior, some of those same consequences will occur. By the same token, if you don't understand what's being said to you very well, if your receptive communication is poor, you're going to look really non-compliant a lot of the time. It's also clear to see how restricted interests can then be translated into problem behavior. If you really only like a handful of things, but you like them a lot, you really, really enjoy those things more than most people would, then when your access to those things is restricted, then you might see how problem behavior is more likely for that individual. The same is true of repetitive behavior. And in some cases, repetitive behavior can itself become a form of problem here. There's some early work that's been done that shows that things like stereotypy can evolve into self-injurious behaviors. And the same is true of cognitive impairments. If you don't understand how to, if you haven't learned social norms or you haven't been able to learn very effectively from other folks, um, from other people, you might see how problem behavior could emerge. So again, not a core symptom, but clearly when autism goes untreated or when an individual is not um, it, it is exhibiting some of the core symptoms of autism, it's not hard to see how problem behavior might evolve from those core symptoms. So, so for lunch today, I had the buffet, right? And the thing that I like about buffets is that you have a whole lot of options. Right? There are a lot of different things that you can get at the buffet, and, and the logic of the buffet is that something's going to be of interest to everybody. So hopefully today my talk is a little bit like a buffet. Hopefully I'll cover a lot of different topics and something will be interesting to at least, to at least some of you, at least some of the time. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about treatment for problem behavior, and specifically some of the factors that are predictive of treatments being successful. Um, so the, the first term I want to use is this term topography. And topography refers to the form that a problem behavior can take. Uh, so there are many different forms of problem behavior. I've mentioned a few, but even just taking one of those types of problem behavior and talking about the topography, if you thought, think about aggression, aggression can have many topographies. It can be hitting, kicking, biting, scratching, pinching, headbutting. Many of these things are all just different examples or different topographies of problem behavior. 
And when I am in clinic and when I work with families, you know, one of the things I hear a lot is we've tried that particular behavioral strategy and that doesn't work. I'll hear time out, doesn't work. Or I'll hear we tried sticker charts and those don't work. And the truth is oftentimes it's not that the treatment itself is a bad treatment. The issue is that it's a bad match between that treatment and that individual. Um, and so one of the ways in which people match treatments to children is based on the topography of the behavior. So a, a topographically prescribed treatment, or a treatment that is determined based on the topography of the behavior, looks kind of like this. Problem behavior, fill in the blank, X equals treatment Y. So for example, this might be something like a child who hits, hitting equals ignoring. So someone says, well, any time that the child hits, then you should ignore that behavior. That's gonna be a good example of a topographically prescribed treatment. And the, the truth is that this type of topographically prescribed treatment would be applicable to all children. So any child who hits, you should ignore that child hitting. Um, this is the type of advice that a lot of people get from, from family and friends. If you go out in the community, sometimes people are very willing to tell you how you should manage your child's behavior. You know, I go to family functions sometimes, and my, ch my children act up, and the first thing I hear is, didn't you go to school for this? But the second thing I hear is that there's lots of opportunities to, for people to tell me about how I should manage my child's behavior, and often it's in this form. It's, well, when your child does this thing, you should do this next thing to try to manage it. So I'm gonna give an example of a hypothetical young man because I like hypothetical kids because they do exactly what I need them to do to make my examples work. Um, so Tim, in this case, we'll say Tim's a 14-year-old boy, and we'll say sometimes he screams and sometimes he hits his parents. He mainly does this in two situations. Number one, he does this anytime they turn off the television. Number two, they do this when they ask him to clean his room, okay? So if we're using a topographically prescribed treatment strategy, then we would say something like screaming and hitting equals ignoring, right? Anytime he screams or hits, we should ignore that behavior. So let's take those two situations that we talked about, right? When they turn off the television and when they ask him to clean his room. First, he hits and screams after his parents turn off the television and they ignore him. Well, in this situation, if we think about this from Tim's perspective, well, when I scream and hit, not only do I not get to watch television, I don't get to do anything fun, um, I don't get to interact with my parents, and so over time, we might expect that Tim would learn that this is not a very effective strategy for him. The screaming and hitting doesn't produce access to the television, and over time, he, he would learn not to, to scream and hit in that situation. But now let's look at it from the other perspective. He screams and hits after they tell him to clean his room and they ignore him, and from Tim's perspective, he's thinking, when I scream and hit, I don't have to clean my room. That's exactly what he prefers. That's a preferred outcome for him. And so he's actually more likely to scream and hit in that context going forward because his parents have reinforced this behavior. And so what's the alternative? The alternative to, to these topographically prescribed treatments would be function-based treatments. And this term function is gonna come up again and again in my talk today, and so I wanna be really clear about this. Um, function refers to the consequences for a behavior that keep that behavior occurring again and again, that from the child's perspective, reinforces that behavior and makes it more likely to happen again in the future. You can sometimes think about this as the purpose that the behavior serves for that individual. It's very individualized, so this is part of why treatments are, are personalized for these particular children based on the function that their behavior serves. So a function-based treatment might look very different. Instead of behavior X equals treatment Y, it would be behaviors that are maintained by particular consequence X is, results in treatment Y. So in this case, that would be every time a child screams that to get attention, you might ignore them, but every time they scream when you present demands, you follow through with those demands or if a child screams when access to a preferred item is restricted, you make sure that they don't get that particular item. So if you think about Tim again, if you think about Tim in a function-based treatment for him, hitting to access preferred activities should be ignored, but hitting to escape from demands should mean that the caregivers follow through with that demand, that they actually present more demands or they present them more quickly. So if they say, go clean your room, and he screams or hits, that they immediately take him to his room and they make sure that he starts cleaning right away and they do it faster and so forth. So, if we look at those two perspectives again, nothing's changed with respect to how he reacts when they ignore him following turning off the television. But when it comes to following through with demands, now when he screams and this hits, he still has to clean his room. This is likely to be much more effective. And so in this case, we see that for this individual, different treatments for the same behavior, but when that behavior serves different functions. And the truth is that function can be, again, very individualized. This can mean that for one individual, different behaviors serve different functions. Different behaviors serve the same function. 
same behavior serves different functions, it's very individualized. And this is why treatments oftentimes will work for some individuals but not others. It's because it's max, not necessarily matching the function of their behavior. I want to talk just briefly about some of the different types of functions then and how these apply to individuals. The first would be a term that is sometimes used in, in this literature uh, that is social reinforcement or social functions for problem behavior. This is a somewhat deceptive term. Sometimes people think that this means social interaction, which is not necessarily the case. In this jargon, uh, social means that another person is involved in the delivery of a particular consequence. So in the chain of events that leads from problem behavior to access into consequence, someone else is involved. That could mean that a cookie could be a social reinforcer. If the child hits, and then there's the cookie, and someone else is involved. So mom has to reach up to the top shelf to get that cookie for the child. That's what makes it a social reinforcer, that mom is involved in the chain of events that leads to eventually accessing that cookie. Social positive reinforcement would just mean, again, someone is involved in the chain, and the child gains something as a result of that behavior. Social negative reinforcement, again, person's involved, but something, uh, something is removed, something aversive is discontinued, it goes away. Um, this is looked at as sometimes an escape function. Now this is important because we have to contrast this with behaviors that are maintained by automatic reinforcement. So an automatic reinforcer is just the opposite. Instead of another person being involved in the chain of events that leads to the consequence, this is a behavior that just automatically produces that consequence. As an example, um, in our clinic we had a young man who would, who would poke at his eye. He would had to have his eye reinserted on several occasions, which was something I didn't know you could do. Um, and he would poke at his eye and reach demonstrated through several different studies that um, he was poking his eye because if you push your eye, and I don't recommend that you do this, but the, the photoreceptors in your eye will fire due to pressure instead of light, as they're normally supposed to do. And for him, that was the most preferred thing that happened in his world because he didn't talk, he didn't really consume a lot of preferred foods, he didn't have any leisure skills. So for this young man, he would poke at his eye because he saw flashing lights and those were very reinforcing. And so this is an example of, he pokes at his eye, he sees flashing lights, nobody else is involved in the chain of events that goes from behavior to consequence. And that's why we would call that an automatic reinforcer. This is an important distinction because behaviors that are maintained by automatic reinforcement are very different to treat, and in some cases much more difficult to treat because we don't have control over the consequences that are maintained. If you think about the example of the cookie, as a clinician or as a caregiver, you have control over whether or not that cookie is delivered, but I don't have control over whether or not he sees flashing lights when he pokes his eye. So there have been a series of studies over the last 40 years, and this is a very well-established uh, line of research now, called Functional Behavioral Assessment, and this originally started in the 80s with a series of studies looking at trying to identify the function. Initially, these studies were done with self-injurious behavior. Um, to, to develop a methodology for identifying the function for individuals. And so these are some data from that, that initial study by Awad and colleagues in 1982. If you look at this graph, and I'll try to orient you to it. Let's see if I have a pointer here. So if you look at this graph, each of these data points represents one 10 minute session. And in each of these sessions, a different set of uh, variables are being evaluated. So I'll start with just, and, and along this, this uh, y-axis is the amount of self-injurious behavior that occurred in that 10 minute period. If you look at the condition that's looked at, that's called play, the open circles. This is a condition where the child has continuous access to attention, no items are being restricted, no demands are being presented. And you can see that for this individual, no problem behavior occurs in any of those conditions when that's the case. Contrast that with a condition that's called academic, and in this case that means academic demands were being presented, if the individual engaged in problem behavior, then, then essentially the therapist replicated what a therapist might, or what a caregiver might do, and, and removed those demands. and said, never mind, you don't have to do that, and they would give them a 30 second break where they would remove those demands very briefly. And what we see is that problem behavior is very elevated in these conditions whenever that was the case. And this would suggest that for this individual, his self-injurious behavior serves a social negative reinforcement function. That is, he's using the self-injurious behavior to make demands go away. He's using this as a form of escape which tells us a lot about what his treatment needs to look like. That tells us that things like time out are never going to be very effective. That if we ignore problem behavior, he's likely to learn the wrong thing. And so that's why we would use a very different set of strategies for this behavior compared to a set of uh, behavior that serves a different function. Again, there's 40 years of research on this, this uh, type of assessment, this functional behavioral assessment. Many, many publications in many, many journals. And there's evidence to suggest that since this 
technology, this methodology has been developed. There have been many advances in the treatment of problem behavior, including decreased reliance on punishment-based strategies and extension of this methodology to a wide range of problem behaviors that include things like stereotypy, um, PICA, noncompliance, elopement, et cetera. So there's a wide, uh, it's had a tremendous impact on the field and on the treatment of problem behavior and for the individuals who um, receive them. There's also evidence showing that treatments that are based upon a functional analysis are significantly more effective than those that are not. So I want to talk about how one then takes the information that comes from a functional analysis and then in turn uses that information to develop an individualized treatment for a particular child. So there are four main components to every function-based treatment. Uh, and I'll go through these one at a time and try to uh, expand upon these in a little bit more detail. Obviously, I won't be able to go into a lot of depth. Again, there's a lot of research that's been done. There's basically a whole profession that exists that, use, that goes into detail about each one of these different uh, components, uh, but I'll try to hit the highlights. So first, when it comes to managing problem behavior, there are several strategies that rely on dealing with antecedent events, so things that come before the problem behavior. These can largely be grouped into two main categories, either manipulating motivation or discriminative stimuli. When it comes to manipulating motivation, these would be strategies that eliminate the reason for the problem behavior occurring in the first place. We had a young woman last year that we treated who would become very aggressive. And she would become very aggressive any time a non-preferred song came on the radio. Or she wasn't pretty much freely able to access preferred music. Um, she would be very aggressive towards her dad. And this would be particularly problematic when he was driving on the highway at freeway speeds. Um, very dangerous. She would attack him from the back seat. She would grab the steering wheel. She would pull on his seatbelt. He had pulled over at one point, and she got got loose on a freeway where people were traveling at very high speeds, and she was in a lot of danger. So this is a very dangerous strategy, or so this is a very dangerous behavior, and and this is probably not the time to just kind of work through it, right? This is not the time to ignore this and hope that things get better. Um, this is one of those times when we want to use antecedent-based strategies to eliminate it altogether. We can work on those other strategies at other times when things are much safer, but when they're driving on the freeway, that's the time when you create a playlist of all of her favorite songs, put it on repeat, and just let that thing play all day long as long as you're driving, and eliminate the reason for engaging in the problem here. Now, there's some drawbacks to that strategy, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but this is an effective strategy, and it's an important tool to provide to caregivers so that those times when problem behavior is intolerable, you can manage it more successfully. The second strategy is to use discriminative stimuli or bring the behavior under the control of the right time and place. I just saw a young man earlier this month who engaged in stereotypy. It was uh, some hand flapping and body posturing, and it was the kind of thing that created a lot of social stigma. It was affecting his ability to form friendships. And this was the kind of thing that his parents were okay with ex him exhibiting this behavior some of the time, but not when he was attempting to make friends or he was attempting to interact with, co with, with peers. And so we worked with this child to develop a strategy where he learned that he could effective, he was able to engage in that behavior at home, but not at school, or not when he was around peers. And so setting up a strategy so he would be able to learn a time and place when this would be, be okay, and other times when it was not. And essentially what we did, we used a wristband. And when he was wearing this wristband, it meant that you're not supposed to be engaging in hand flapping when it was off, uh, and he, he was allowed to engage in the hand flapping. And he quickly brought that behavior, that behavior quickly came under the control of the wristband, such that he was not doing that out in settings where peers were around. And it would create social stigma. So this is, I just want to speak briefly as a, as a clinician and not as a researcher, and this is, this is something that I've observed a lot in my clinical work, and that is that there tend to be, uh, there tends to be a continuum with respect to the use of these antecedent-based strategies, and just in general, the degree to which caregivers kind of fall in one camp or the other. These, this is my terminology, this is not something you'll see in the literature necessarily, but I've tentatively titled these accommodation and integration. And I've seen many caregivers who fall at one end of the continuum or the other, most fall somewhere in between, but there are some families for whom they take the attitude of my child has a, has a disability or has autism spectrum disorder and I want my child to be pretty happy, and so we're gonna more or less accommodate problem behavior. We're gonna allow it to occur most of the time. We're not gonna get too worked up about it. We're not gonna push very hard. We're gonna allow this behavior to occur and the world is gonna adapt to them as opposed to the other way around. We have other caregivers who decide, you know what, my child, yes, they have autism spectrum disorder, but we want them to be as successful as possible. That means that we're going to try to teach them as many skills as we can. We're going to try to address problem behavior as much as possible. And what we tend to see is that one set of parents are trying to avoid problem behavior just about no matter the cost. Whereas another attempt to work through that problem behavior 
And what that means is that this child might eventually be pretty happy most of the time, whereas this individual might be pretty upset a lot of the time. The other difference, though, is that this individual is learning a lot more skill. And they're learning, their problem here is being addressed. What, what becomes an issue is that exclusive reliance on antecedent-based strategies where we're eliminating the reason for the problem here. If the young woman who became aggressive whenever a non preferred song was played was just allowed continuous access to music, that's fine. We may see that there might not be a lot of problem behavior a lot of the time, but when the CD player breaks or she's in a setting where she's not allowed to have music, then we see pretty significant problem behavior. And so it's important that if what we're really interested in is trying to develop this type of individual who has some skills and is able to tolerate instances where those motivate, those reasons for the behavior are going to occur, then it's important to find a, a balance that is not shifted entirely over to the side of accommodation. The second component of interventions is, is to disrupt the relationship between the response, the, the problem behavior, and the consequence. This is sometimes referred to as extinction. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important to know the function. If you don't know the reason for the behavior, it's very difficult to make sure that that consequence doesn't occur. If you think back to Tim, we had that example where he was engaging in problem behavior to escape from demands. If we don't know that that's the case, we don't know how to make sure that that consequence of escaping the demand never occurs following problem behavior. And so extinction looks very different for the individual based on the reason for the problem behavior. For positive reinforcement, extinction is going to look like making sure that that consequence never occurs. For negative reinforcement, it's going to be making sure that the, the stimulus is never removed when problem behavior occurs. For automatic reinforcement, it's much more difficult, um, and that's partly because we don't have control over the consequences. That means probably more reliance on some of these other three components. I just want to show a graph of an example. This is a child that we treated earlier this year um, who was engaging in problem behavior in the form of aggression. On this graph, you'll see that the, uh, each one of these represents a another 10-minute session. In this initial phase, this was from the assessment portion or our baseline. So in this condition, he would engage in, someone would restrict access to a preferred thing. They would take away an iPad, they'd say, no, you can't play with the iPad right now. If aggression occurred, they would treat it, again, much like a parent would, they'd say, never mind, here's your iPad back, he would get 30 seconds of iPad before they would try to restrict it again. And what you see is that problem here was occurring at a pretty high rate, probably an average of about five instances per minute. We then implemented this extinction where he no longer got the iPad when he engaged in problem behavior, that they would actually continue to restrict access to the iPad, and over time, we see that that problem behavior decreased to very low levels, much more manageable levels. We repeated those two conditions to show that this was not just an artifact of some random circumstance, but it was actually because of what we were doing, and we see that those patterns continued. That is, the problem behavior went away when he was no longer accessing the iPad for engaging in that problem behavior. Now, there are some important points to keep in mind when using these types of strategies. First, there are some side effects. One is that when extinction-based protocols are employed, um, problem behavior oftentimes can produce uh, things like extinction bursts, which about 36% about of the time, problem behavior will get worse before it gets better. That is, that there will be a burst in the intensity or the variability of the behavior. This is important because it's often the case that caregivers are not prepared for this, that the individual might not be ready to work through this, ex this increase in problem behavior, and so they start using a treatment, things get worse, and they stop using the treatment right away because they're not prepared. And this is a particularly important because if that individual um, does something like they say, well, Dr. Call told me that I need to follow through with this particular task, they go ahead, they start following through, the child engages in a more intense tantrum, the tantrum or the problem behavior lasts even longer, maybe 20, 25 minutes, and then the caregiver says, all right, never mind, I can't do it anymore, and they give in. They tell the child, all right, you don't have to do that task anymore. From the child's perspective, thinking about what that child has learned, they've learned, well, next time mom tries to get me to do that task, I need to go at least 25 minutes before I give up, because there was that one time that 20 minutes in, they, they gave up. And what we know from that is that this can produce what's called an intermittent schedule of reinforcement, which there's probably 50 or 60 years worth of research showing that that is the most effective way to develop behaviors that are resistant to treatment, that persist for long periods of time, that become very rigid and, and robust uh, and are ineffective, dark, very difficult to treat. The, the next piece is to reinforce some alternative behavior. So if we are trying to extinguish problem behavior or use extinction, we also need to complement that with making sure that there's some other appropriate behavior that will produce access to the same set of consequences. So just if problem behavior is, is maintained by positive reinforcement, we might do something like teach requests. So if I go back to this graph earlier, I only told you half of the story. The truth is, while all of this was going on, we also were teaching more adaptive or appropriate ways to access the same thing. So for this same young man where we were restricting the iPad, we were also teaching him a request, we taught him to say iPad please, which for him, he had no real functional communication prior to this. 
And so once we taught that response, we'll see this panel here represents the amount of communication that he was engaging in. Once communication began to occur, this is co-occurring with reductions in problem behavior. And so what we saw was that those two, that one, one behavior replaced the other, and he was effectively able to use communication instead of problem behavior. The last piece in these treatments is to make sure that these are maintaining social and ecological validity. And I think that within my profession, this is especially something that is too often overlooked. And this is the degree to which the treatment is actually producing a meaningful outcome for the caregiver, for the individual. So that can mean generalizing treatment to new settings, to new people, to new places. Again, just because I can get a child's behavior to look good in a clinical setting doesn't mean that it's helpful for the family. I need to make sure that it's effective in the classroom, that it's working for the parent, and that it's working out in the community. That can also mean things like making sure that the schedule of reinforcement is there. So if we think about the young man I was just showing you, we look at his graph, he's asking iPad please and he's getting it, but he's getting it every time. That's not a very realistic treatment for most caregivers. And so if you look, this is just condensing those same data into a smaller screen. If you look at this, we initially, for this same young man, we taught him to be able to accept basically no for an answer, that sometime you're gonna ask for iPad and you're not gonna get it. Now initially, we set up intervals where we had him wear a wristband, red wristband, and a green wristband. If he asked for the iPad when he had the green wristband on, he got the, the, the iPad. If he asked for the iPad when the red wristband was on, he did not. And initially, he only had to wear the red iPad. That's the, the um, white triangles here. He only had to wear it for 90 seconds at a time. So for 90 seconds, if he asked for the iPad, he didn't get it. Now initially, there was a burst of problem behavior, but it again returned to lower levels. We also saw that pretty quickly, he stopped asking for the iPad nearly as much when he was wearing the red wristband. And we were successfully able to fade that to about a period of 15 minutes. We got to the point where he could go 15 minutes at a time wearing the red wristband, and then we moved to the home. We continued to extend that period of time. He was eventually able to get to work. He could wear the red wristband for an hour and a half, not ask for the iPad. Mom could go about her business. She could make sure that he had periods of time where she could go to the store and not have to take the iPad or other preferred items with her, and he could tolerate those through this system of making these treatments more socially valid. Now, again, I mentioned that I want to try to make this you know, a little bit of everything, and so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the limitations of the research that's been done in this area, as well as some of the things that, that our lab is trying to do about that. The first thing is that most of this research has been done in well-established clinics that have a lot of resources um, that use very small numbers of participants. So it's a lot small end research, which is really good for showing what's possible. And when I want to know what's possible for one, tr one child. When I'm approaching this like a clinician, that's the right thing to do. For that young man, I just showed his data. I want to know what we can achieve for that young man. But at the same time, what this really limits is the possibility for knowing to what degree is this externally valid? To what extent do these findings generalize to other individuals? There's also a real possibility of publication bias. So when you're only publishing three participants per study, Sham and Smith did a paper recently where they showed that this is really susceptible to publication bias and that we don't know if there's hundreds of examples where the same strategy has been tried, but doesn't get published because it's really hard to publish negative findings. And so there's a real need for doing larger studies. An example of this, this is something that we just published not too long ago on the treatment of pica. Um, if you look very closely, you might see in this x-ray, there's a safety pin, there's a pin in this young man's esophagus that had to be surgically removed. I often tell people, do you want to see a collection of really weird x-rays? I have a great collection in my office. Um, but this is a behavior that's deadly. This, is, this same young man um, swallowed a tablet of chlorine from a, a pool that he was swimming in that he had to go to the ER. And, um, this is a behavior that's very, very dangerous. Up until very recently, the largest treatment data set for any treatment of study with pipe that had three participants in it. Now that's very limiting. Again, there's a very low external validity. These treatments were successful, but we don't know if those treatments were successful with lots of kids, or if there are lots of examples where people tried these treatments and they weren't effective elsewhere. And so what we did was we took all the participants we've seen in the last 10 years. We had 12 participants, so four times, or 11 participants, almost four times as many as any previous study. And we just looked at our treatments in terms of effect size, which is something a little bit different from what's typically done in this literature. Overall, our effect size was 1.8. So if you think about a large effect, a very robust effect would be a 0.8. We're significantly higher than that, showing that the types of treatments that we're talking about can be very, very effective. And this was all of the children that we saw. Regardless of whether it was successful or not, we took every child that we treated, and we had tre tremendous effects. So these data would suggest to us that these strategies can be very effective. And we're doing similar studies now on the treatment of elopement, and these are leading to clinical trials that we're doing with NIH also treatments for ankylosis. So moving this literature from these small N, very individualized treatment studies to larger N clinical trials is a really important step 
in this literature overall and making it something that is able to show that these treatments are effective out in the community with larger numbers and that they, they are effective in, in an externally valid type of way. Another thing that's really important in this literature, and again, an area of, of previous real, uh, of weakness in this in this literature, is the way in which uh, treatments have, treatment outcomes have been defined. So within this literature, largely these have been defined in terms of topographical or structural outcome measures, things like uh, a caregiver will come in and, and a clinician will say, well, what's the problem here? And they might say aggression. Well, then a treatment goal might be an 80% reduction in aggression. But that's not a very meaningful outcome to that caregiver. That might not mean very much to them if 20% is still requiring them to provide constant supervision or they're still being hospitalized as a result of that. And so a more functional goal would be something like if we talk about something that we're using now in our clinic, where we ask a caregiver, if this treatment is effective, how is your life going to change? How are you going to be better off as a result of this treatment? And if the mom says, I need to be able to take this child to the store, well, then an effective outcome measure is, is mom going to the store? And so these are the types of treatment goals that we'll set. And that allows us to measure outcomes much more effectively and in a much more socially valid way. So if we look at something like the treatments that we've been using, um, we see effect sizes, as I mentioned, of 1.8. Our effect size for the treatment of a lobin in a similar study that we've done had an effect size of 2.1. So these are, these are outcomes that sometimes I'm accused of faking data. They're so high. Um, and then when we look at things like when we, we talk about maintenance of these outcomes uh, that are measured more so, in a more socially valid way, we're seeing that these are maintained at about an 86% maintenance of goals at a six-month interval after treatment. So highly effective treatments that can be very robust. <coughs> Now the last thing I want to talk a little bit about, and this is, again just moving into a slightly different direction, uh, has to do with the fact that all of these treatments are, tend to be caregiver mediated. Which is to say, again, it's, I, I can be very effective at bringing problem behavior under control in my clinic. I have lots of staff, staff who have protective equipment, staff who are trained to manage aggressive behavior, staff who get paid to deal with really significant problem behavior. But that's not the case for most of the caregivers. And so if, if problem behavior comes under control in a clinic, that's not very meaningful for that family. And so it's much more important that these treatments be able to be executed by caregivers. If this treatment is going to last and work in the community and the home, the parent has to be able to implement it. And that means if we want to produce positive outcomes, we have to make sure that the caregiver can implement that treatment with fidelity. And if that's going to be the case, we need to make sure that the caregivers understand the treatment and they're bought into it. And so that means that we need to look at some of the factors that affect caregivers and how they perceive these treatments and whether or not they implement them consistently. And this is a real area that hasn't been addressed with much fidelity, or hasn't been addressed in the literature hardly at all. <clears throat> Things like delayed to treatment outcomes. So most of these treatments take a while. These are not treatments that have an immediate effect. I mentioned some of these examples earlier where the child has to learn. If this, isn't a, if this doesn't produce a preferred outcome, then they stop engaging the behavior. But it can often take something like six months for these, behavior, these treatments to have the intended effect. And it may be the case for some of these caregivers that six months is just too long, that they're not finding that it's valuable to them if it doesn't have a pretty immediate effect. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit into a, a different literature, something that's called delayed discounting. This is some literature from the behavioral economic area of behavioral economics that, that I participate in to some degree. And this is just the tendency, delayed discounting is the tendency for human beings to discount or devalue a commodity the longer they have to wait for it. This is oftentimes used, studied using what's called an adjusting amount procedure where, and it's oftentimes used, uh, money is used as the commodity. Money makes a lot of sense for these types of studies because it's something that most people have experience with. It's easily quantified, um, and so it makes a lot of sense. And these studies generally look something like this. So if I present you with a choice between $1,000 today or, or right now, or $1,000 tomorrow, who's going to choose the $1,000 now? Show of hands. I'll wait a second for our translators. Who's going to choose the $1,000 now? There's an objectively right answer here. So if your hand is not in the air, come talk to me later. We need to talk. All right. Most people choose the $1,000 now. That's the choice that makes a lot of sense. All things being equal, why not take the commodity now? But what happens when that immediate commodity starts to, to decrease? What if it's $995 now or $1,000 tomorrow? Some people might still take $995 now, but eventually that's going to decrease to a point where there's a switchover, and that's called the indifference point, the point at which the individual switches from the immediate amount to the, to the delayed amount. And this, we might plot this on a graph, and then repeat the whole process with a different delay. So $975 now, what about if it's $1,000 in a week instead of tomorrow? Well, then people might go back to choosing the immediate amount until we eventually get a switch maybe at $925, and at that point, we plot that on the graph, 
And we eventually see data that look like this. Now, this is a study by Rackland and colleagues. This was done with smokers. And they were looking at discounting for money. And one of the things that you see is that this curve here represents the discounting for money in current smokers versus yeah. ex-smokers and never smokers. And these data show that as the time increases, that the subjective value that they place on that commodity decreases more or less steeply, right? So those who were smokers were discounting money much more steeply, that it affected their choice making pretty significantly. Now don't worry about the math, but, but essentially this equation has been used, it's a, it's a quantitative model that fits these data very well, and what we can do is we can solve for k in this equation, we can do a little bit of algebra, and solve for k for an individual, and that number represents the, the sensitivity of that individual to delays to outcomes. And so we can figure out, we can put a number on somebody and say, just how sensitive are they to delays to access to money in this case, given the choices that we gave them. Now, much of this research, as I say, has been done with money, but there have been other things that have been looked at. People looked at things like drugs or food, and then there are a couple of exceptions. One is, that's my favorite, they looked at discounting towards finding a romantic partner, which, sure enough, that does tend to show the same pattern, but also health gains and losses. Um, and so this is a study that we model some of our research on, and the reason we looked at this was because much like the, the discounting work that's been done on health gains and losses, we were interested in this question of, do parents do caregivers make choices about treatments based on how long it takes for those treatments to produce their outcomes? That is, we wanted to know if a parent basically, if a parent goes to the store and they say, and their child throws a tantrum, and the parent can say, well, I can do what Dr. Call told me to, and six months from now, I'll be able to go to the store and he won't throw tantrums, or I could just give him the candy that caused the tantrum now, and he'll be quiet now. And what we're finding in our clinical work is that a lot of the parents are choosing now. They're choosing to give the child the candy now because they want quiet now, not necessarily to implement the treatment. They're making the more impulsive choice. So this is a study that's been published at this point. Our initial study had 17 caregivers, all of whom their children being treated for problem behavior. We followed the same model that I just described in the study that looked at health gains and losses using the same commodity, same amount of money. But we also made one important uh, change and that was we presented an additional series of, of choices that dealt with, with treatment outcomes. And essentially we gave the parents the choice between treatment A that produces some reduction in their child's problem behavior, in this case it was for a period of 10 years, it was the same amount as they used in the health study, or they could choose treatment B that produced the same outcome but they had to wait a week. Now most parents choose now, right? Again, same as with the money. But eventually we get to the point where they switch, where they make that switch from an immediate treatment to the delayed. Sorry. We get the same indifference point, and we plot those data, and we use the same criteria that are used in the behavioral economic literature. What we found is that for 14 of our 17 participants, they exhibited the same pattern of behavior that is present in the same choices with money. So the model that holds up exactly the same, and this has some important implications. These are our data for treatment, and again, they look a lot like the ones for the, that have been used when looking at money. And what this does for us is we've now, we've extended this work to look at, at delays to treatment outcome and how they might be affecting parents. Sorry, if we go back to this graph, one of the things we see is that overall, parents are showing that at around a six month delay, the average treatment, the average caregiver valued that treatment at only 86% of its original value. So it lost 14% of its value within six months. But that also was an average. We also had some parents who were down here for whom if that treatment took six months to have the intended effect, it had essentially no value to them anymore. And that's an important finding because that tells us that we have to deal with that parent very differently than we do a parent who's up here, who's willing to stick with it and try a treatment even if it's not gonna have the intended effect right away. We've extended this research now. We've continued to look at other types of treatment. We've been comparing parents who have children who are being treated not just for problem behavior but also for skill deficits. Um, we've also started looking at this in terms of teachers versus parents. We've been looking at some cultural differences. Um, and we're also looking at how effort might affect these same choices. So not just the delay to treatment outcome, but how hard is the treatment for that caregiver. This has some implications again uh, uh, in that, first, there, there are essentially three things we can do with these data. The first would be, we could just be more selective. We could only work with the parents who show the pattern of behavior that suggests that they're gonna stick with it. They're actually gonna implement the treatment the way that we intend. Now, I, I would suggest that that's not a very satisfying answer, but it's certainly one option. Another would be to provide interventions to caregivers that are catered to them. So we could actually try to address this impulsivity on the caregiver's part, try to do something so that they're more likely to stick with treatment. And those are some things that we're undertaking right now where we might be able to just address that sensitivity to delays 
directly within the caregivers. And then lastly, as a field, we probably need to do a better job of de developing treatments that have a more rapid effect. Um, we need to have, and we can develop treatments that are more customized to the caregiver. So now that we're profiling caregivers based on their sensitivities to different dimensions of treatment, we're starting to specify our treatments not just for the child based on the function, but also to the caregiver based on which factors are going to most influence how they implement those treatments. So a caregiver who's particularly sensitive to the effort of that treatment might need a different treatment than a caregiver who is sensitive to the delay that's going to be required before that outcome mm -hmm. is achieved. So I thank you all for your time and your interest today. And I also want to thank a bunch of other folks who have helped produce all of this work. And I'll leave you there.